Alex Roy. Uh, I am not a blogger. Uh, I am an editor at Time. Uh, I hold multiple Cannonball records. Uh, I am an angel investor in the self-driving car space. Uh, and my presentation title, which was What's in Showroom Today, is not accurate, but I'll answer that question. Uh, Tesla Autopilot, which is uh, good. I set the Autopilot and EV Cannonball records cross country in a Tesla three times, including in a Model 3 a few months ago. Uh, it's lacking in driver monitoring system, and as a result, it's unsafe. I'm just Cadillac Super Cruise in the CT6, which has a driver monitoring system, uh, but a limited operational domain, and is a lot less fun to exploit. And that wraps up that question and the entire presentation. So we'll move on to what I want to talk about, which is uh, ways of thinking about automation. Um, I um, really enjoyed Mr. Jonas's presentation. I read all your stuff. I agree with most of it. I'm absolutely convinced that automation, well, of course, automation is inevitable. Uh, autonomy and uh, its iterations is not so much. I should also add that I'm the founder of the Human Driving Association, uh, which does not mean I'm against automation or autonomy, but it does give you some perspective on my thoughts. And I would say this as an investor in technology for 20 years, um, billions and billions and billions of dollars have been lost betting against human nature. That's the history of investment. It's a history of technology. It's a history of human nature. So uh, what kinds of automation and autonomy actually make sense? Is this the advanced clicker? Here we go. Um, I'll just do it manually. All right. So uh, I will use myself as an example of human nature. A uh, hundred years ago, uh, Erwin Baker was hired by Cadillac and Stutz and Gartner and pretty much every car manufacturer in America to drive vehicles cross country to demonstrate that internal combustion was safe, reliable, polluted less than horses, and that a thing called um, a gas station, which didn't exist, was unnecessary because you go to pharmacy and buy uh, canisters of fuel. Um, uh, 1971, Brock Yates, the editor of Car and Driver, and Dan Gurney, the greatest F1 driver of all time, drove a, a Ferrari cross country in uh, 35 hours and change, uh, and began this race called the Cannonball Run, which ran through the 70s. Time Magazine did a cover story. There is a very inaccurate film starring Burt Reynolds, um, <laughs> which I love and inspired me um, to drive. Um, this is the route they took from New York to LA, uh, 2,811 miles. Um, this was my first attempt to do the same thing, dressed like a police officer. Um, it, you'd be surprised. There's no law against impersonating a foreign police officer in this country. Um, so um, this was the, the second attempt. We thought we'd mix it up because the first time we got caught, so we went to Spanish police. That was uh, pretty good, pretty good. Um, then uh, we went as Italian police, which was very effective, very effective. But then we thought, well, we're so good at doing this. Uh, why don't we, if we just skip the outfits, we'd be more effective, no outfits. That, well, we did do one more time, the German police in Arizona. So uh, we learned, humans are good at learning, um, and uh, eventually we took the stickers off the car, we disguised ourselves as storm chasers, the New York Times uh, came along, Wired Magazine came along, um, and let me add, I love technology. This was the interior of the car. I, I can't get enough technology. You name it, I'll buy it first, adopt it. I don't care if it works. Like in RoboCop, who cares if it works or not? Spare parts for 20 years. So, um, this was, we're, we're quants. I'm not a good driver. I'm really not a good driver, but I'm a great planner. And this was our drive plan. I was, it was off by three minutes, our projection versus our final time cross country. Um, this is a, a really interesting picture, not because of the speed, 161 miles per hour on, uh, on the interstate, but because we learned about the effectiveness and reliability of uh, driver systems. Uh, you can see the bottom, it says tire defect warning, which I knew wasn't true. Um, because you just can't trust technology all the time. Uh, ultimate edge case is a human who wants to get there faster than the machine says it's possible. So um, this is a picture taken from our spotter plane. We had an aircraft flying overhead. We matched speeds. The plane was near its stall speed at about 140 miles per hour. And uh, they followed us during the daylight hours. Uh, with, we had white electroluminescent strips on the roof so they could see us at dawn and dusk. Um, our final time was 31 hours and four minutes. Um, that was an hour faster than the uh, old record, uh, and it has since been beaten by almost two hours, which is incredible, uh, because the people who had done this, Brock Yates himself, the organizer, said it would never, ever be beaten, because road quality is getting worse, police technology is improving, traffic is getting worse, it's impossible. And yet, despite everything he said, this is the godfather of this, he was completely wrong, completely wrong. So, um, all this time I've been thinking to myself, like, uh, this is so bad. Why am I doing this? It's illegal. It's wrong. It's dangerous. It's immoral. It's so unsafe. 
And, but, but no one was going to stop me. It was impossible. And, uh, and it, but, but why does safety have to be in conflict with freedom? Does, does it have to be? I mean, it's, the conversation seems to be binary. We need self-driving. We need to be safer. Therefore, humans are bad. It's a zero-sum game. Human input is bad. Machine input's good. You, you reduce humans, you increase machines, life is better. And yet, you can't tell me that. I mean, I believe in automation, but you can't tell me that there isn't someone like me being born today. And I know there are, because my record's been beaten. I've set 25 more records since. And hundreds of people, I wrote a book about it. I went to jail. I, I, I get invited to the FBI Academy to talk about it. And all the FBI agents said, God, we really wish we could do that. And then they told me how they would break my record. And one of them retired, bought my car, went out and did it. So there's something going on here about human nature. Um, so are they in conflict? I, I use the cannonball run as a metaphor for <laughs> the worst parts of us, but maybe the best parts of us. So why do, do, I, do I do this? Why do people buy cars at all that they don't need? Well, identity is part of it. My identity is wrapped up in James Dean um, because my father, who was in the US Army, World War II, came back. He saw James Dean in this car and said, I gotta have that car. So he bought the car and I'm gonna meet, and he wants to meet women. And boy, did he, because here's my mother with uh, my father's next Porsche. That worked out based on this image of me coming home. And uh, then you can see where this went with my first car collection. And then uh, my, the, my current daily driver in New York City, this absolute piece of junk Morgan three-wheeler, which is, I think, the greatest car ever, ever made because it's, it's so analog. I'm so connected all the time. I'm, I'm in danger of being killed whenever I start it up. And then let alone just take it out of the garage. It's a great car. So um, Will Wright, uh, who was the uh, inventor of the game SimCity, which I'm sure some of you urban planners are familiar with SimCity. Yes? Someone here. Yes. Come on. Uh, and the game The Sims and Sim Earth and lots of Sim games, unbeknownst to most people, in 1981, uh, he bought a Ferrari 308 and he went cross country on an illegal race called the US Express and he won. He loves driving, can't get enough of it. And he speaks very lucidly about our relationship between cars and machines. And he says, well, when you have an accident, you don't say my car had an accident. You say, I had an accident because the car in effect has become your body. It's an extension of self. And that's so true when you look at the history of car design. The, of the first car to go into the MoMA is this Jaguar E-Type. It's obviously a body, a, an organic form, a very sexual form. Obviously, it looks like a sex organ. No, the cliches are all true. There is a relationship here. There's a psychological factor. Look at the other great cars in car design. Well, Pagani Zonda clearly looks, I'm sorry, not very woke of me to say it. It looks like a female form, not a male form lying down on a bed about to get up and go somewhere very fast, very sexual and organic. What's this, a Porsche 911, the German interpretation of a sex organ in motion? Look at it, it's clearly an organic form, it speaks to us. Citroen SM is kind of a male and female form at the same time, it's a weird looking car, but very beautiful. People love this car, that, that was mine, it caught fire, I, I had to sell it. Um, a Morgan Arrow 8, is, this is a brand new car. It, it, they're terrible cars. I love, I, they're terrible. They're made of wood, they're terrible. How can they still be in business? The guy, not at Morgan Stanley, maybe it was someone at Morgan Stanley, Jonas, are you still here? He left, well, one of his guys said that in the future we would go from like 20 car companies to 18 to 14 to five and Morgan. And the only reason they would say that is because Morgan would stay in business for an irrational reason. People buy this because it speaks to something within us that has nothing to do with reliability or quality. By the way, this thing makes Teslas look like Lexus. It's incredible. So um, anyway, uh, they're still in business. So what we drive says something about who we are, obviously. And how we drive them says something about what we do or what we think we can do. These are two axes of human psychology. And that's apparent in, in, in the cars we buy. I'm, Tom Vanderbilt uh, read, wrote a book called Traffic. Has ever, anyone read this? It ha if it's not 100% in this room, there's a problem in this sector in the discourse. He, this book, Traffic, which is about traffic and driving and, and culture, describes driving as a form of speech, which of course it is. If that wasn't true, Drive AI would not have raised all the venture capital money to develop a form of graphical and audible uh, conversational si uh, to talk to pedestrians. Driving is a form of speech, as, are, as is the driver behind the wheel, even when we're not in motion, the, the gestures we make. So, Transportation is, and, and, and transformation are two concepts. We talk about cars and getting places, transportation, that's not true. Cars, the cars we buy are actually transformative because they say something about who we are, what we can do, even when they're not in motion. For example, what does this say? 
Every manufacturer in the world makes a car like this. It's not very sexy, but it's, in fact, it's perfect. And, but if it was perfect in the minds of all consumers, this is the only car that would be sold, or it's equivalent. No one would buy anything else. They'd all be gray, they'd have no options, just A to B vehicles, pure mobility. And yet pure mobility clearly doesn't appeal to people because they buy other cars and they buy things like this. And even if they can't afford them, they dream of them. It makes no sense this thing, from a practical standpoint, as in terms of mobility, is absolute junk, it sucks. But people, kids, dream of them, why? Because people are irrational. Or maybe they're perfectly rational, because the goal they're trying to get to isn't mobility. It's self-expression, it's catharsis, it's car as body. So what does this say? Oh, not very woke, but it says something about the buyer. What does it say? This thing is not about mobility, but he bought it anyway. In fact, this is the reason he did buy it. So, what does this say? Great car, Porsche 911 Turbo S, amazing, $186,000. Perfect sports car, awesome. But this version, which has no roof, is more expensive. It's actually technically inferior because it's not quite as safe, and the structure's not quite as rigid, performance is like 1% inferior, and yet it's more expensive. Why? The visibility. Not the visibility out, the visibility in. Everyone can see you more valuable. Right, Grayson? <laughs> Tesla Model X, <laughs> it's great. it doesn't matter what you think of Tesla. The bottom line is that this car makes no sense. It makes no sense, except it does something that the Lamborghini does. It does this. <laughs> this, is, this is the whole thing. Without those doors, who would buy it? It makes no sense. So, Sigmund Freud talks about the two life drives. The, you know, the life drive arrows, the death drive, Thanos. What is the, what is the life drive? Plant more seeds, go to Home Depot, save up, send your kids to college, the, you know, the, the future, it's good. And then the death drive, I'm faster than you, my car's better. It doesn't matter if I can drive it, my car's better, I'm better, you suck, I'm me strong, you weak, me win. The death drive. So, let's talk about the history of advertising and Freudian theory. In advertising, there are only two messages for all products ever made in the history of mankind and sold and marketed. Two messages. First message is, do you love your children? The life drive. Home Depot, a vehicle to fit the stuff from Home Depot, whatever it get, yeah, I put in there. That's the one message. And the other message is have more sex. That's everything. And in modern times, as everything, everything's been commoditized, even performances are commoditized. And that's why when you buy a minivan today in a dealership, they offer you sport options which are sexy, that don't do anything. The cosmetic options, bigger wheels and tires, the GT Sport version, the S-Line options, carbon fiber in a minivan. It makes no sense. That's because what they're trying to do is get people who've now had those children to feel sexy again and sell them the whole thing in one package because most people don't want to buy two cars. It's not practical. So um, we know what this thing says. And it doesn't matter if they don't sell. It doesn't matter. It's, an, it's a symbol. And we know what this thing says. So um, for 100 years, cars have been sold to us on, for sex, power, and danger. That's it, that's all the messaging, that's everything. And that, that's profitable. Safety, mobility, not profitable, relative to options packages that people actually don't exploit, like bigger wheels and tires and, and horsepower and chips, all of which is meaningless on the street. So uh, James Dean, we all know what that says. You're gonna take someone who's been sold sex, power, and danger, and you're gonna put them in this? You're not. You're just not. It's not gonna happen. Um, so, because people dream of this. They, this there's no, you, you go to a Pebble, Pebble Beach, you, this is there, this is there. There will be a museum of autonomous vehicles, and if you go to Mountain View, and you go to the Museum of Technology, it's empty all the time. No one goes. I've been, I think it's really cool, but no one goes. It's pointless. So, purpose of technology is what? To solve problems. What are the problems autonomy is supposed to solve? The case argument, I love acronyms. Everyone loves acronyms. The acronyms look great in investor decks. Case, connectivity, autonomy, sharing, electrification, all great. However, each of those things, those problems, pollution, safety, traffic, have been around for thousands of years. They're, they're not unique to the technology that we're trying to create today to replace prior technologies, they are functions of human nature. It will always exist in some form because second order conse consequences beget third order consequences and technology always improves. Human nature doesn't change. Behavior changes, but not human nature. So, you cannot solve for it. So, I'm gonna race right through this. Uh, why do we drive? We drive despite 
all the things, the inefficiencies. We drive despite all the reasons we shouldn't. We do all kinds of things that make no sense. Ritual, control, and agency are the core of human psychology. People who feel deprived of these things do act out. Sometimes they act out really badly. There are shootings, there are all kinds of things. Bad things happen in the world, often because of that. So, uh, what, is, what are the options? Automation does not have to be a continuum with a single line. And autonomy does not have to, is not necessarily, it doesn't have to be an end goal. It can be a means to address human nature. And whether it, we d decide it's a single line or there are multiple paths to get there, is a, it's a choice. Can't, do we want to be in baby seats like in Wall-E? Or do we want technology to be a means and an exoskeleton to augment human desires and agency to achieve maybe even greater goals? So the difference is whether we are actually one with a machine, as Will Wright, who knows a thing or two about technology, would suggest we should be, and whether we are none with a machine, whether the machine is the ends, we are so, the safety is the ends, and that we are separated from our machines who perform tasks for us but with whom we have no actual relationship because instead of augmenting us, they're replacing us. So, uh, Will Wright, in fact, said that the analog vehicle in the late 80s was the ultimate mind-machine interface. We would get no closer. And if you think about that, why do people like vintage cars? It's not that they're worse in every way, except design-wise, they're cooler, but they're technically worse. Performance-wise, they're worse. All the stuff back then, it sucks you get into an old sports car, but people love them. Why? The number of linkages between the human mind and the, the, and the actual pavement are fewer. The closer we are from input to output in the, in the real world, organically and tangibly, the more cathartic value we derive from the experience. You could pay someone to carry you up Mount Everest, but you're the guy who got paid to go up Mount Everest. So you get into a car in 1988, which I consider the apex of analog car design, and at that point, you had your, your mind, the hand, steering wheel, steering uh, column, steering rack, you know, and then the wheel tire road five, six mechanical linkages. Today there could be 30, there could be 50, most of which are software layers. And you could feel, the cars are quantitatively superior, but they're not as much fun to drive. They just aren't. And so there's something going on here. Um, and, and what's happening when you get into a Tesla, uh, it, and I'm, by the way, I'm not against Tesla, but I, you have to recognize the reality here. People give in, if you give them an inch, if you, if you offer them even a lifeline, or you're not gonna be responsible, don't worry about it. Most of the time, they assume it's all the time. So that, the diff today, when people have an accident, they don't say, I had an accident. They say, autopilot had an accident. They, whether they know it or not, and they're often prepared to lie, they want to abrogate responsibility immediately because of an over-reliance, an over-trust in technology they don't understand. Technology is only as good as our understanding of it, of our appreciation of it, and our, as the education given to us of how it functions, what its limitations are. So, all these words um, are soup. Um, I can explain what I think they mean, and most people can vaguely explain what they think it means. They're almost always wrong and vague. In fact, none of the definitions you find in Wikipedia or most publications are accurate, and they're overlapping. And is there cursing here? They're not good. They're not good. Um, the SAE levels are entertaining and unhelpful. I have suggested an alternative taxonomy, which we'll maybe get into uh, shortly. Um, here's the chart. Uh, we can hold, do another presentation. Fine. I have decided to replace that prior chart with this, these two categories, geotonomous, it's autonomy defined by location, and human assisted systems, because you the prefix has to describe who's responsible and liable. But I guess we're not gonna address that here today. I believe in this. Um, Boeing and Airbus already fought 40 years ago, 50 years ago, they already fought all the battles pertaining to how automation should be deployed in aircraft. And you could easily draw these, th those lessons to the ground. And yet, wherever I travel, I find very few people from commercial or even military aviation working on self-driving cars. Hardly any. And so, and yet they fought this already. And uh, they are very different systems, and yet crash rates with two types of aircraft are the same, almost identical. And the, diff the reason is because people um, don't really understand how safety, how, what, the, what the paths of automation and safety are in aviation. In an Airbus, you have a flight envelope protection system. You have a software layer between inputs and outputs. They're constrained. If everything works, the pilot cannot override it, and you are, they are safer. In a Boeing, you have similar 
warnings and constraints, but the pilot can push through them. So you have two approaches that have the same crash rates. The difference is in the crash types. And there are lessons to be drawn from this from how automation is deployed on the ground. And yet no one is deploying systems that are similar, except in the form of primitive traction control and, and stability control, siloed, very primitive architectures that are not linked in a holistic system to actually make drivers safer, because they don't understand what the individual systems do. They just don't. So, and people think all of those things are what an auto autopilot does. An autopilot has nothing, in, in an aircraft, has nothing to do with safety. It's, it's, it just keeps the plane straight and level and does some minor navigation, not a safety system. So that's nonsense, and I hope, I'm glad Jonas isn't here to hear me say that. Um, so when we look at semi-automation, there are in fact two paths. There's a series path, which is what every car manufacturer in the world is working on, which is um, a mistake. Tesla's doing it, everyone's doing it. It's a mistake, it's unsafe, it replaces people, and there's skill atrophy and it's dangerous. Parallel systems mimic what Airbus is doing. They don't exist in cars today, they're superior. Um, the perfect car of the future is not one without a steering wheel. It's one that is autonomous in zones where we choose it to be or it's mandatory, or if we take the wheel, there's a parallel system like a safe driving car like Kornhauser describes that uh, prohibits us from crashing. And that car is a 911 with a steering wheel that I turn into a wall that turns back. That gives me agency, autonomy, and safety. So the future is that. That's the future. And there will be fleet-owned autonomous vehicles, but the most of the world for many decades will have cars they own and they need to have safety improved and we have to give them systems and those systems are rare, rarely in, talked about at all. A TRI is working on both paths. They have the Guardian system and Chauffeur, which is the pure autonomous system. And, uh, well, I guess I won't tear this up, but it's a mistake. Um, and this is my timeline, which I guess is no time to discuss. I believe parallel systems would be a much larger market than autonomous systems for the majority of the next 30 to 50 years. Um, because autonomous systems will need a lot of time and work to be built out from the geofenced areas where people like my friend in the back thinks they will be sooner. He's wrong, his daughter will have a steering wheel, will have a driver's license, you're wrong, because not having one is a cage. Um, my mother and her Porsche 911, because uh, who said she will drive till the day she dies, unless Porsche offers a parallel system, I hope they do. Um, binary thinking about any technology is slavery. Things never play out the way we think. Um, technology should be a means on an ends. My mother wants an augmented car, and I really have to wrap this up. This is the history of cannonball records, every one of which said, people said could never be broken in an internal combustion car. Um, I broke it twice, and I believe an augmented system will get across the United States in 24 hours in the next 10 years. Um, this is the history of electric vehicle records. Also, everyone said they'd never be broken. I broke it three times. Someone will break it again this year. Human nature cannot be stopped. We'll bend technology to our wills. Um, oh, the Human Driving Association, which I launched, is not opposed to automation. We embrace all forms of automation that address human nature and make driving safer. Please sign up. It's free. No time for Q&A, right, Kornhauser? Uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> but we will have a lot more discussion. Uh...